A warm welcome to everyone tuning in to our first 2022 installment of the Emily Dickinson's Museum's reading series, Phosphorescence. In her poetry, Dickinson uses phosphorescence to describe a divine spark, an illuminating light. We launched the series in 2021 in celebration of the power of poetry to spark the imagination and ignite change. And we are now thrilled to return for a new series of readings running monthly now through December, bringing you established and emerging poetry from all over the world. My name is Elizabeth Bradley, and I'm the Education Programs Manager at the Emily Dickinson Museum. Since we can't hear your applause tonight, we hope that you will consider sharing words of affirmation and appreciation in the chat during the readings. So if you want, you can start right now by telling us where you are tuning in from. Tonight's program is going to last an hour, We'll take a few minutes at the end of the program for conversation, so you can participate by adding questions for the poets in the Q&A feature as we go. Also, please note that we have enabled Zoom's auto transcription, which generates closed captions to the best of a computer's ability. There will be some errors in transcription along the way, so you can choose to use or not use this feature. To turn it on or off, just go to the live transcript button at the bottom of your Zoom toolbar. So now, without further ado, I am thrilled to announce tonight's program. Tonight, we are asking a question. What happens when four poets from four countries who have never met have a conversation in poetry? Morag Anderson, Barbara de Courcy Roy, Maeve McKenna, and Audrey Malloy share the same writing group and decided to collaborate on writing a chapbook, How Bright Wings Drive Us, which went on to win a publishing contract with Derek Press in Scotland. Beginning with the seed poem, Coloratura, clear themes begin to emerge around feminine awakening, motherhood and aging, and the associated burdens of each stage, with musical and botanical threads connecting and weaving throughout 40 poems in the book. I'll introduce each of the poets now. Barbara de Courcy Roy lives near St. Louis, Missouri. Her work has been published in The Galway Review, Head Stuff, Skylight 47, Pandemic, and Pop Shot Quarterly. Barbara collaborated on How Bright the Wings Drive Us, which won first prize in the 2021 Drake Alliance Chapbook Competition. She is a founding member of the international writing group Poets Abroad. Morag Anderson is a Scottish poet based in Highland, Perthshire. Her debut book, Sin is Due to an Open Room Above Kitties, explores human connections, concealed violence, love, and everything in between. Morick's poetry has been published in many literary journals and anthologies. Maeve McKenna is a poet living in Sligo, Ireland. Her poetry has been placed in several international poetry competitions, published in Mislexia, Orbis, Sand Magazine, Fly on the Wall, Channel Magazine, and others, and widely online. Maeve was a finalist in the Jakar Press Evan Bullen Mentorship Award 2020 and third in the Canterbury Poet of the Year in 2021. Her debut pamphlet will be published in February 2022 by Fly on the Wall Press. Finally, Audrey Malloy is an Irish poet living in Sydney. Her debut collection, The Important Things, was published by the Galway Press, the Gallery Press, excuse me, in 2021. Her work has been widely published in Australia, Ireland, and the UK. In 2020, she was awarded a Varuna Residential Fellowship. She is currently undertaking an MA in Creative Writing at Manchester Metropolitan University. And now I am um, pleased to turn it over to Barbara and to all of you, some of you who have been, who have just told me that it, you've tuned in at late at night, early in the morning. Um, so pleased to have you here with us. Good evening. I'm delighted to kick us off this evening by reading uh, the poem that uh, Elizabeth just mentioned, Coloratura. Um, it came uh, about that we use this poem as a seed poem to get the conversation in poetry rolling. And um, it was a poem that Audrey had remembered, uh, such a short little poem, but it stuck in her mind. And 
from about six years ago when we were working uh, on an online workshop together. And so she suggested we use it as the seed poem and I'll read it now. Coloratura. Forgotten pond rises, peepers pipe, trees drip rain, slake thirsty earth, sap seeps, cherry weeps. Crocus leaps for joy. Spring remembers how to sing. The next one uh, I'm going to read was an experiment with sound. And when we started writing uh, the pamphlet together, I went down a bit of a rabbit hole watching musicians on YouTube <laughs> and letting the music just kind of move my writing. And I decided to read another short one tonight in honor of uh, Emily Dickinson's Wild Nights, Wild Nights. This is Wild Nights uh, uh, version 2.0. It's called Blue Notes. As bees in honey drown, be my little sugar pie, honey bun. Mellow me, blue, as Charlie Parker's saxophone. Drown me, honey. Rough me up. Day old beard, buzz me. Midnight nectar, puddles. Jasmine, moon vine. Drink, drink me, take me down, rock me, let me drown. I credit Emily Dickinson with keeping me inspired to keep writing. Uh, way before I was ready to step into the world of writing workshops and risk showing my work to strangers, I gave my poems as gifts to friends and family. And when I got impatient with myself or I was doubting my abilities or my, my real talents, I would tell myself, uh, well, you know, if it was good enough for Emily Dickinson, to give her poems as gifts, it ought to be good enough for me. And so um, this next poem uh, is, uh, come, came out of um, a workshop uh, that I was also participating in while I was working on uh, How Bright the Wings Drive Us. And it's kind of what happens when you don't believe in yourself or you can't. Overwrite. Oh, and I should add, there's one line next to the last line that you'll recognize from the Rilke poem, uh, the archaic torso of Apollo. That was the poem we were studying in the workshop. Overwrite. A powder blue Smith Corona the splayed spine of Mrs. Dalloway, a silver bowl of damson plums, frilly parrot tulips limping on the windowsill. Last night's empty bottle, the Chesterfield sofa where she slept with the television on, dreamt of giving head to Apollo's archaic torso, its eyes opaque like Andrea Bocelli's. Children with designer backpacks, hopscotch on penthouse rooftops, eat plantains with nannies homesick for Jamaica. The jealous God reclines, admires his six pack abs, precious prick. When the bleeding begins, she is jubilant. Confidence, a gas leak, so faint, no one notices. 
she wonders if she should stop coloring her hair, renew her subscription to the New Republic, give up on the manuscript. You must change your life, but no becoming has needed her. Women writers uh, often struggle with setting boundaries and protecting their time, saying no to toxic influences. Emily Dickinson begins uh, her poem, I think it's 303 in one edition. The soul selects her own society, then shuts the door. I remember when I decided to stop making excuses for why I couldn't write. My last poem I'll read is called The Maestro's Ex-Wife. The Maestro's Ex-Wife. She bakes his damaged heart into a Wellington, spreads a thin layer of pate between flesh and pastry, saving the aorta for a pudding, hums a tune while she cooks, face flower white where bruises used to bloom, arms hers to move as she wills, conduct an unseen orchestra. Ears hear each note as from a songbird's throat. C major, minor, D major, minor, E, F, G, A, B, shame released as sound Mary's sense. The scales order her days. She eats when hungry, sleeps when weary, bathes in the icy lake when she craves a thrill. Toes like tree roots clutch the loam. Body home at last, a well-tempered clavier playing solo in virgin forest. Thank you. Now I'm going to uh, turn things over to my friend, Morag Anderson, who's coming to you from Scotland. Take it over, Morag. Barbara, thank you so much for kicking things off this evening. Hello from Scotland, where the witching hour is creeping towards me. Thank you so much for having us and thank you for being there. It's great to have an audience. Through underground communications, trees form alliances with trees of other species, interdependent, each feeding the other. And so this collaboration evolved over four countries, all 40 poems interdependent, each feeding the other. The poems I've chosen to read this evening navigate themes of migration, religion, poverty and love. All are bound by elements of the natural world. The first poem I'll read is called The Laird and the Summer Walker. Laird is Scots for landowner. Summer Walker is Scots for indigenous highland traveller. A distinct ethnic group in Scotland with their own culture, language and traditions, firmly rooted in Scottish written history as far back as the 12th century, but a minority still discriminated against today. In Scotland, we're lucky to have the, the legal right to roam, but that's made easier for, for some than for others. The Laird and the Summer Walker. To jeers and whistles, her wagon rolls east through villages of slate and stone. She gathers willow sticks by thistles burn, stretches her bow tent and sets the kettle to flame. Day's unrest salts her skin. A bloom of dust clings to the ragged hem of her skirt. 
He finds her sitting in wild garlic and dog violet, tells her to move on. Like me, says she, this tree takes only the space it needs. What will fill the borders when all wild flowers are pulled from hedgerows? A road without highland travellers is a night sky without stars. Under the oak's green ceiling, she tucks her bairns under blankets of tarpaulin. We are all children of migrants. Our ancestors moved from village to village from one country to another, perhaps. Our children will be migrants. Some are lucky enough to choose and some are not. Some of my ancestors were displaced from the Outer Hebrides of Scotland during the Highland Clearances of the mid 1800s, very few by choice. We forget sometimes that people leave more than just land behind. This next poem has a small Scots Gaelic phrase, Molien of Bake, which means my little one, my, my wee baby. Mother tongue. While sheep feast, I am outside in with fathomless hunger, brine washed on this brig, salt crusts my hollows. My belly and breast wither like the rotted crop, and you, Molien of Bake, cloth wrapped in sand. In limbo between two lands, I pray for soil above or below, but no god holds sway in the deep stench of steerage. Sun skims the hammer beaten sea, lights a passage back home to a cairn of small stones where water lessens the shore. I will join you in the dunes, Molienav Bake, and with a flotsam mouth, sing dry my lungs. I wrote this next poem in memory of an outstanding mother, my own, who died young. In 1970s Glasgow, during a time of acute poverty, she once stole food from the meat processing factory she worked in to feed her four children. She, of course, went without. Food poverty and period poverty are still prevalent, shamefully, in Scotland today. The Deep End. Flaccid light and piss reek seep in from the communal hall. It takes both cold hands to form a grip, turn the key, unlock the door. The kids still asleep in a pleat of thin limbs under sheets and coats and a lanced heart nailed to the wall. I take the pack of sausages from the waistband of my skirt, bend carefully to pick apart damp knots in oversized boots, but still dislodge the bloodied wad of my makeshift sanitary pad. I slide down the wall, pull my knees to the ladder of my ribs and bleed. The aging process changes more than just the body. The very young and the very old can share various traits, difficulty feeding themselves, repeatedly asking the same questions, struggling to fasten buttons on coats or shoes, generally only one lot amuse. Let's offer kindness and grace to every age. Threshold. I lie flat, cup the jut of my hip bone in the hollow of my palm, finger the slow waltz of femoral pulse. I hear her rise. The carpet soft pile does not absorb the sound of remorse. It is time. She crouches, 
joints crackle like dry leaves licked by a bonfire's tongue. She was six when I teased a slice of glass from a knee that bled Halloween red. I wrap my arms, thin as willow sticks around her neck, feel blood drum like a samba de roda beneath skin warm as churned butter. I forget now which one of us is daughter. I shall dedicate my last poem this evening to Emily Dickinson, of course. Her relationship with religion was complex and at times irreverent. Poem 1545 begins, the Bible is an antique volume written by faded men. Two things I know, Father Byrne. One, the size of the needle's eye through which I am observed will remain unchanged, whether I borrow modesty from a pencil's nib or empty my mouth of truths so loose they form candy floss clouds above my gunmetal town. Two, the length of eternity for you who stalks the walled grounds stark and forlorn is equal to that of my lover who leans in thorn-threaded hedgerows naked as winter's larch and waits for me to prick his sensibilities with the tip of my tongue. Thank you for listening and I'm now going to pass over to my wonderful poet friend and collaborator Maeve. Thanks Morag um, and Barbara hard to follow that now <laughs> um, but um, yeah so I'm here in um, Sligo in uh, rural Ireland very beautiful place and um, one that inspires me all the time to write and uh, so the first poem I'm going to read tonight is um, inspired as well um, by my surroundings. We, I have loads of fields outside where we live and um, there seems to be a family, maybe generations of foxes that um, seem to kind of appear now and then. And um, my writing practice or lack of practice probably is more true is that I stay up really too late and then I get up too early and I sit down to write and then I end up just looking at the window at the stars or the fog in the morning or something like that. And one morning, when this poem first came about was uh, looking out at a fox and I imagined uh, the struggle of the fox and, um, and her coming out probably looking for food for her family and how that struggle might reflect uh, the human struggle. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Before waking. Mid-March, stunned by another 6 a.m., I have been awake in parts two hours. Flecks of dust settle on the window pane. A fox across the open field, one I announced as having claimed us, now seems unfamiliar. Chameleon of rusted amber, then furious red. These are the loneliest minutes of my life. I am happy here most mornings, watching dew dissipate, fearless dandelions slipping their wet shields, grass frost, its white innocence warming to silver, then vanishing. And her, our vixen, scavenging the dark length of night, stalking death by paw, unaware of preened coats panting at the lair, newborn cubs, blinded, unhearing. Her breath pins a trail of fog I follow with my eyes, shafted light sculpting shadows. Then a sudden spiral, a staggering at my wrist. I make sense with what I have left until I can't. Thank you. And this 
second poem I'm going to read is very short. It's a short little poem. And it was, it was definitely inspired by Barbara's seed poem. <clears throat> I can remember about that back in the day. And I suppose this poem just imagines what, what it would be like, um, you know, and uh, if we imagine our life, our lives to you know, in the cycle of nature and um, and sometimes like our lives seem to resemble a storm or maybe a stormy sea and the strange comfort in being in the belly of the beast and um, how you know we there's a sense that you know things can't get any worse when you're there and you return from it maybe with a new perspective um, but it's always quiet if we could just hear beyond the noise this poem is Cold Calm. <clears throat> Deep as winter in a robin's eye, seasoned as a silver coat of sea salt, breathless as a running child, exposed as a sheltered slope assaulted by a summer swell, clouded as a puddle of rain, Sensual as a basket of hot cheriola buns, bitter as last night's dolcetto. Voluptuous mouth, velvet toned, voice resounding inside an echo. We are swimming back in. Isn't it quiet? Thank you. And the next poem. <clears throat> is uh, a short enough poem as well. And again, I go back to nature, which I do often in my poetry to, to tell the human story. And um, in December, 2020, my dad passed away and um, it was in you know lockdowns and isolation. And I would visit Lizardelle quite often <clears throat> and it's a beach and woods and um, I found great comfort there during that time. And um, I suppose, you know, the cyclical process of nature and what I felt was that what I was going through would pass, you know, and, um, and, 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 and the memories, you know, like that we carry through the seasons of our lives, you know, they, they, they just, I just felt so consumed by the grief and, um, and and felt so nurtured by the woods and by nature and um, and I did of course have to refer to Emily Dickinson in poem 420, 410 where she said the first day's night had come and grateful that a thing so terrible had been endured I told my soul to sing and maybe one day in the woods I did tell my soul to sing <clears throat> sorry this poem is called Do No Harm. Trees tilt, listening for echoes that cannot repeat. How remote this woodland becomes the closer your trust. Moss has latched onto bark, a suffocation of colour as you tread the buckled path. And ahead, a squirrel scurries down the trunk of a spruce. Panic certain as your will, burrowing under the graves of brittle leaves, his frantic sense of you gathering a wreath, dandelion, bugle, snowdrop, whispering, my desire is to do no harm to you. Thank you. And the last poem. dedicate to my daughter who's not here tonight because she was out last night celebrating the end of her placement so she's a bit tired tonight and <laughs> um, so I mean this poem as we spoke about in in you know in in our many discussions during this collaboration was um about motherhood and um you know being a woman in this world and uh and this poem speaks of um a moment when my daughter came home from the UK uh, on one of her visits she's studying over there and when she left and it's always great sadness for me when she leaves and uh, I found a fake eyelash on the, on the uh, bathroom sink and uh, it was like this moment and um, 
I was instantly transported back to when I was younger and kind of comparing it to, to young women now and the kind of pressures they're under and the beauty myth. And I couldn't remove the, the, the eyelash for so long. Um, it was just one of, it was just, just kind of got me. So out of that moment came this poem, <clears throat> How Bright the Wings Drive Us. The playlist reverses fully into sound. Wheels rotating manic rims, monotonous hands fussing. Neon exit signs in city alleyways. Cameras shooting music videos starring a 19 year old shadow. Locations shift, hauling hollow cabinets into loud rooms. Oncoming cars of high lives, pointless progression from one breath to another. Drifting into the woods without company is courage. Branches mimic staccato slaps against metal, monologues of wooden mouths absent on the passenger seat. Dream deities isolated on the sink, an eyelash. It is fake, of course. Oh, mourned feather. Leave it. Cleaning the hand basin is reckless, irreversible. The sun blinks, captures every bright wing. Thank you so much, everybody. And it gives me great pleasure to hand over to Audrey Malloy all the way over there in Australia. Thanks so much, Maeve. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm feeling quite moved after those readings. Uh, Barbara, Morag and Maeve are a pretty hard act to follow. Thank you so much for the beautiful, beautiful poems. And thank you so much to Elizabeth and Patrick. It's a, a real honour to read as part of the Phosphorescence series for the Emily Dickinson Museum. So it's about 9.30 a.m. here in Sydney. I'm reading from my home in Rushcutters Bay or Yarran Abbey, as it's known to the traditional custodians of the land, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Um, one of the really remarkable things about this collaboration has been the way after a week or two of throwing about ideas and themes um, and sharing some very inspiring music that we all started to resonate with each other the way a note played on one instrument can resonate with another, like harmonics. And I can still feel that um, among the four of us. Well, all four of us are mothers, and that's something I assumed I'd be since I was about four years old. People say the years fly, um, but they don't, they don't tell you that there are times when the hours and the days seem to crawl. Um, my son, my middle child, put to me one day that there should be such a thing as the speed of dark. Um, and he said, Mom, if the speed of light is the fastest possible speed, the speed of dark is the slowest and any slower and you would be completely still. And I said, I know what you mean, because some days feel like that. So this first poem is called The Speed of Dark. I pour maple syrup into yogurt and swirl. The amber ribbon stretches, frozen waterfall, from bottle to bowl and spirals into oblivion. Centuries pass. I peg, unpeg, peg, three sizes of socks. They droop comatose, sailors on a penny hang, only my wits flap, the scene unchanged, though ice caps melt, freeze, melt. I chop pale apples and taut dark plums in sleeping cicada seven year shifts. The blade is keen, yet my brain edge dulls with monotony. Just let me be while I swirl, peg and chop. Don't rupture my flow with your turbine whine, your bicker and snot, your kicking like cornered foals. Oh, darkness come. 
on this black plain that stretches bare to all horizons like a lake at night. Far behind me, three small trees, twisted from earth into trunk and limb, they orient me. Days melt into their cheese on toast. Years pass like starving bats, while minutes creep until they sleep when the clock swings to life like a metronome. I'm pretty sure there's a big nod to Dickinson in there. <laughs> um, another influential American poet in my life is Bridget Peggy and Kelly. And I've been thinking about her poem, The Dragon, since I first read it several years ago, uh, where a swarm of bees seems to carry a snake across a garden. If you can get your head around that. Um, and I'm fascinated by how a poem can invent an entire world and that these worlds might intersect, if only in the imagination. This next poem is called Swag, and it's about another type of poverty um, that women experience, time poverty, something common to every mother of young children in particular. Uh, back when the four of us were collaborating on the book, Morag sent a message one day to say that she was writing quietly in stolen time. And I started to picture stolen time as something you could touch or pick up and transport like a treasure or swag to be passed on from one woman to another across the ages. Swag after Bridget Peggy Kelly. In a batik purse encrusted with mirrors is a drawstring bag of fine kid leather and in that bag, a nugget of stolen time. Tarnished black, despite the lack of oxygen, a brisk wrap on the hem of your dress reveals a gleam like a trout in a windbrushed lock. No one knows who took it, but suspects are many. The first time mother in the milk stained blouse who sleeps only fitfully between feeds. Or the part time telephonist squeezing the skin from the pale green innards of defrosted peas. Or some shadow in a story long ago. Ported on longboat and curragh, high nelly bicycle, barrow and cart, through drought, inundations and mud. It has even been carried by swarms of blue bees, dangling its long swinging strap in the semblance of a chartreuse snake. Oh, that's all been written before. Um, a couple of Dickinson's poems are etched into my imagination since, ever since I encountered them in the text Soundings in high school, my first year of high school, um, because I could not stop, stop for death and I felt a funeral in my brain, which grabbed me from the very top, first time I read them and fascinated me with this idea of thoughts living in the brain and the permission that Dickinson gives us to be obsessed with mortality if we want to be. This next poem, Afterlife carries that influence. I was walking one day in my local park in Rushcutters Bay, full of figs and sycamore trees, and I had this uncanny sense of being invisible. And I wondered if I'd actually died and I was only imagining that I was walking. I think this happens to all women eventually. We are reabsorbed into the ingredients of things. Afterlife. Four days passed before I realized I was dead. Invisible to the living, though my senses remained tuned, sending canisters of texture and form through the pneumatic tubes of my nervous system. The leaves of the plane trees spoke through pale green Rorschach mouths. And for the first time, I understood. The air was cool. And amid the ground mist, sapphire spears of damselflies shone with dew. No one nodded as they moved through parks and streets. It's hard to pinpoint the moment when I knew I'd no longer catch a stranger's glance, like a cabbage white in the fine nylon weave of my occipital lobe for pinning to the 
What if bored of fancy would never feel again the faint calligraphy of fingertips on skin still damp from loving? It could have been the instant when I paid the old chai walla at the kiosk and he looked away or when I couldn't smell the cardamom or hear the knocking of a blowfly serving aces to its double in the counter glass. These things I noticed only slightly, just as a rhino sees the silent silhouette of its assassin downwind. But I observed acutely other things. The strand of once brown hair that fell across my eyes, transparent as the wing glass of a demoiselle. My eyes reflected in these crystal strings, pink as an albino's, no trace of green remaining. The blue that had marbled my inner wrists for nearly 50 years had disappeared. I wandered on, fading, becoming now the sodden tea leaves, the jewel rich insect, the Shantung bowgown tree. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for those poems, all of you. That was incredible. And I see so much love and, and connection happening in the chat as well. Thank you to our audience for, for your words of affirmation. Um, so this is a reminder to everyone that if you have a question for our poets, you can place it in the Q&A feature of the chat. But for now, I will just kick us off with a question. Um, I'm so taken with your story, um, how you decided to collaborate on a chapbook while working in four different countries. And I'd love to hear more about what the unexpected joys and obstacles of working from multiple continents has been. Well, I'll, I'll, say, I'll say one thing about the joy of being in lockdown and being able to have this level of depth of communication. I, I went to sleep because we're in different time zones, writing and sending off a poem. And I woke up and there was a new poem in my inbox from one or more of uh, the group. And th it was the most exhilarating process of writing I, I've ever experienced. That was yeah. a really wonderful way to collaborate because we were in different time zones. So as Barbara said, you know, I'd wake up in the morning and there would be a string of maybe 20 conversations going on. And you're having to sort of, it was like having your own novel each morning. <laughs> but what was fascinating was how everybody took, it started off with, with coloratura, but it wasn't a linear process because I, I, I was always the last to perform. Um, so I would be taking pieces of everybody's work and creating something different. And that's, that's what it became with time, this sort of big tree of, of, of branches heading off in different directions. So from, from the same initial seed, things just exploded in, in all sorts of, of different directions. It was a wonderful, opportunity, but a great process of learning as well. Yes, I'd, I'd add to that that we um, we didn't really have a plan from the beginning. We just had this little seed that was planted and we we had some music that we shared and some ideas that we shared about being a woman and the sort of different stages and different challenges. And that was just a conversation mainly conducted on the, on the messenger pane. Um, so it was very organic and a poem would someone would post a poem and someone would take uh, you know, inspiration from that poem and write another. And someone might take dif a different inspiration and take it in another direction. So as Morag said, this sort of the tree grew from that without any rigid sort of plan at all. Um, and, and it, you know, became quite magical. So I've spoken about this before and, and talked about the, the movie E.T. where the guys are cycling along on the bikes and then they lift off the ground. And there's sort of this, there's this second, this moment when the magic happens. And I've experienced that in this collaboration where the minds of four people or whatever number of people come, come together 
and start to really um, harmonize and, and synchronize. And you get the same thoughts and the same ideas coming up. And it really is quite a magical process. We also had quite a limited time in which to do it because when we decided to, to enter the, the DRIECH competition, I think we maybe only had a couple of months between that initial decision and the, the submission of the work. So for me, it was actually really good to be working under a degree of pressure. It gave, it, it gave a flame that I wouldn't have had otherwise, I don't think. So it really was a, a rolling constant programme of, of, of change, which for me worked fantastically. I think as well for me, uh, everything the girls have said, but for me as well, it was, um, you know, when you're writing, I, I absolutely love collaboration. Most people, I know Sinead McClure is here. I don't know if Jan is here. Like I pester people about, will we collaborate on this poem? And, you know, I just absolutely love that kind of shared energy between people. And and because writing is so solitary, you know, and um, and, and and sometimes if you don't pull yourself out of that solitude, you you know, you're so center stage in everything you write because it's just you. And if you if you're in a collaboration, yeah, you, OK, you, you you're like we were all duty bound to write our 10 poems or whatever, but like you were so influenced, even subliminally by what was coming into your inbox or what you were reading from the others. And it just, it just, it, it, and it's that trust as well, you know, that, you know, I, I can, you know, I'm, and often we were sending in poems for drafts, you know, and that's a scary thing to do, like for any poet, like, oh Jesus, like, you know, and, but like, you just let it go and, and then worked on it. And, but everything just kind of weaved around. So it was, it was such a, it was a, such a rewarding kind of, process particularly given the time it was in you know in isolation and lockdown and all of that kind of thing where even among our own where in local you know lives we were isolated and all and, and I kind of woke up every day and I thought well like all these girls are in the sitting room with me at the kitchen table and we're all writing poems together it was really felt like that for me you know so it was it was great I, I love this collaborative story. And I, I wanted to ask a question that went off of, of something you mentioned. You mentioned that there is a musical thread that resonates through the poems in the chat book. And this struck me because Dickinson was an accomplished pianist and scholars have argued that she carried the rhythms of liturgical music as well as improvisational panache into her work as a poet. So how has an ear for music and song, or maybe you, you shared music it sounds like as part of the process influenced your writing i'd love to hear more about that audrey shared quite a lot of music with us and barbara likewise both both of these poets are also quite heavily influenced in my opinion by the classical world of of music which isn't really a place that i visit very often so it was an absolute joy to be gifted um, musical links to things that I wouldn't otherwise really have, have come across. Um, and it, it allowed us, I think, to develop a, a strange intimacy with, with four strangers. You know, these are three women like you, Elizabeth, I've, I've never met any of you here, but yet there is such a strong kinship. Um, and the music played a, a huge role in that. I would be much more traditional in, in my sort of musical tastes. Uh, certainly, you know, a lot of Scottish ballads and a lot of um, Gaelic song. I was brought up on Gaelic poetry and, and, and song, which is very different from the classical world. So it was wonderful to have an exposure to something else. And um, Maeve is a, is a huge uh, David Bowie fan. So we had all sorts of, <laughs> and Leonard Cohen, we had all sorts of things going, going on in a, in a musical capacity. I'm Audrey and I got kind of insane about trading YouTube videos of um, arias of classical opera. And, um, and we were especially taken with um, 
you know, the, the tones, the kind of dulcet voices and the coloratura really fed into all that. It, you know, instead of spraying, all of a sudden I was like hunting down divas and looking at um, uh, YouTube videos of opera singers instructing young opera singers on how to bring out the emotions in music. And, um, and then there was a particular sound in one of Audrey's poems and I couldn't put my finger on it. And I started messaging her about what this sounded like. And we discovered together that it was the theremin, which is that, that crazy, like playing the air, like st imagining strings going up into the into the air and using one's fingers to bring this sound out of nowhere and um and when we when we found this guy on the theremin we were so excited um but it it, it was just uh, i don't know like music as the um understory in a sense you know that um and the, the um, whatever that is that when I listen to music, it hits me in my solar plexus. And my solar plexus is where all my poetry comes from too. So I don't know what that means, but um, it certainly was like this underscore to, for me all the time I was writing. I love that image of, of music as the underscore. And I wanna ask a question that I see now in the chat that seems especially pertinent um, to, to some of you and, and to probably many women in the audience. Um, Kristen asks, as a busy mom, always looking for stolen time and finding inspiration everywhere, especially in nature and in motherhood and in teaching writing, I would love to know how all of you made that time as writers and how to overcome the lack of confidence following, following me as a writer. And then specifically mentions, um, Barbara, you touched on finding this confidence at some point. So if you could speak to that. Barbara and, and everyone else. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's that sense of, I think first of all, a lot of the confidence that I currently have and I made this choice about six years ago to get serious about writing poetry and learning about poetry with more um, intention. Uh, but I think that a lot of my confidence comes from the, the kind of writing workshops I've participated in internationally and the women whom I write with and now many more men that I've met, but a core group of women who are so, the, the level of trust and support and encouragement and the generosity of taking time with one another um, has, it, it's probably the biggest factor in my feeling like I can do this. And um, that's why collaboration again is, you know, there's this idea that you're this solitary poet and, you know, you're off in a cabin in the woods somewhere and, um, or the, I, the idea that, you know, you have to go uh, get a, an M. Is every, did we lose Barbara for a second? I think we might. Okay, I think, I think we did for just a second, but um, I think that, oh, you're back with us, Barbara. We, we last heard about how- Sorry, I you lost me or something happened. Okay. But anyway, I, mm -hmm. I was just trying to say that a lot of the confidence comes from the people you write with. And if I could just say to whoever asked the the, 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 the person who asked the question, I mean, it, it, there's never there's never enough time to write. And I think if you if you I certainly find if I beat myself up about, you know, 
and to, trying to do that balance, then writing becomes some something, some kind of like chore or some kind of like indulgence. So personally, my kids are older now and that has really made a difference. So it, I think that is a factor as well. But the words are always there. And I'd say, if, you know, I didn't I hardly wrote when my kids were small in, you know, throughout those years. And, um, you know, but I just just maybe I don't know. It works for me. I bring a, a, a jotter, a notebook and a pen everywhere I go and I might be sitting in the car waiting to pick somebody up or I might be you know out for a walk and get back to the car or I might be you know and even when they were smaller I used to do it I would just jot down words or lines or sentences and um, and hopefully find the time to go back to revisit them and maybe turn them into something you know the time okay. is definitely the time is definitely there you you do just have to steal it out of other chunks of your day you know we we probably all quite frivolously waste minutes that we can clump together I work full-time and I've got three kids and my husband has threatened divorce a few times he's a bit of a, a poet widow um but it is there and it's looking to to where you can steal it when Audrey mentioned stolen time we are stealing it from other parts of our day but when you examine your day or your week it is incredible how you can just steal small chunks of time the confidence thing is is easier to overcome I think because we all feel like cuckoo in the nest I'm sure we all have imposter syndrome at times a lot of the time but it's finding your tribe and it's not being afraid to to jump off the the, the top diving board Fear is what holds us back. And when we remember that everybody is feeling that same fear, it becomes a place of, of trust. And um, if you're in company of, of other writers who are wearing their egos like sombreros, then that's that's not your tribe. Just find, find those that are more like you and that are hundreds of people but it's, it's having the courage to just put your work out even in the in the roughest draft possible and being more importantly being receptive to 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 constructive comments um if if the if the three of us or well, the four of us together if if i didn't rely on on these three guys to be able to guide me if i was fearful of what i was going to hear back it, it wouldn't work so it's being receptive to, to constructive advice, but making sure that, that what you're getting is, is coming from, from your tribe. That would, that would be my, my point on confidence. Coming back to your point on um, the time, where to get the time itself from, um, to the person who's asked the question, my, my kids are still school age and um, it has been a difficult transition to, from sort of, I mean, being a, a mom can take up all the time you have. It's like a gas in a space. It will expand to fill the space. So um, before I dedicate, made writing a priority, I would fill that space. I'd clear out a cupboard or if I had spare time, I'd make a, you know, a, a really elaborate dish or, right? and I'd sort of feel like, oh, I'm getting, you know, the, all these great mother brownie points for doing all these things. But it was, and it was, um, it was, it was rewarding in many ways, but what was missing for me was having that creative outlet for myself. And that is a priority. I have made that a priority and it's very important to me. And it's also important for my need to model that for my children to say, you know, there's more to um, being a woman than, you know, doing things for other people solely, that it is really important that you do something for yourself. And writing is the thing that I do for myself and I do prioritize it. And so sometimes there are sh shortcuts Sometimes there will be a deli lasagna instead of me spending three hours making one because I need that time for this. So that's really important too. Thank you for those answers. Um, there are so many wonderful questions that I wish we could get to, but I also want to respect the time. I give, give all the audience members who are inspired some of their, their time by ending this at seven and well, seven in the East Coast. And um, maybe they'll be inspired to seize those moments and write some poems for, for themselves. So thank you again to our audience for